Welcome to the Anthropology and Business Podcast, where you'll learn about the many ways anthropology is applied in business and why business anthropology is one of the most effective lenses for making sense of organizations and consumers. Through conversations with leading anthropologists working in advertising, marketing, consumer behavior, organizational culture, user experience, and many other roles, you'll learn firsthand what it means to do business anthropology and how the work differs from academic anthropology. We will discuss issues like the pace and depth of research in business, our visibility and influence as practitioners, and what we can do to build our brand. We will also focus on the value and impact of our research in business so that we can help business leaders understand why they should be hiring anthropologists. I'm your host, Matt Arts, a business anthropologist specializing in design anthropology and working at the intersection of product management, user experience, and business strategy. Let's get started. Hi, everybody. Welcome back. I'm Matt Arts of the Anthropology and Business Podcast. I'm here today with Katie Hillier, who is the Chief Digital Anthropologist at the Live Center for Digital Anthropology. And we're going to talk about that a bit um, because they have an interesting partnership going on with UNESCO where they are working to really grow the visibility of digital anthropology and help professionalize that in a number of ways. And so we'll, we'll get into all those details and I'm sure I'll learn plenty myself. But um, aside from the the role uh, at the Live Center in the past, Katie was at What If Innovation, Principal Director of Innovation there uh, for many years. And so it should be a good episode today. Uh, Katie, you are the first on, I think, who technically identifies as a digital anthropologist. So I'm excited to talk about that. So uh, would you start maybe just by explaining how you got interested in anthropology? Yeah, definitely. I mean, of course, in classic um, way today, my my career is very squiggly uh, and my background didn't start in anthropology. It actually started in journalism, but probably with it being an in, having an interest in people and cultures and communities and wondering if I could um, use journalism as a way to tell stories um, about them. Uh, but I, after graduating, I started working the year after I graduated basically around the year Twitter launched, um, and the world was changing dramatically. And I started working at a social media agency at the time, trying to understand what social media was doing, um, and how it was affecting, um, communities and people and changing the way people are behaving. Um, and I use, I, from there, I sort of went there was, uh, I was living in Los Angeles at the time, and there was uh, Charles Annenberg at USC started a startup graduate program called Online Communities, the year, basically the year after Twitter launched and said, what is going on in the digital space? How do we better understand people and communities um, in these spaces, how they're behaving and how it's affecting people? And so it was a small sort of experimental program that I got into um, and was fascinated to just spend time there really learning um, about all kinds of different ways to immerse in digital spaces. The program was taught interdisciplinary by professors across the university from human sciences to data sciences and technology, um, and really was all about exploring um, human behavior in the digital world and what made it different and how we behave differently. And so I've always been very interested in trying to understand what it means to be human um, and how that differentiates across the digital and physical worlds. Um, so that's really where it started. So it was at the time called Online Communities, not in the anthropology department, but sort of a startup degree program that they put into communications and then sort of sourced professors from all over the university. Um, so I did my graduate work there and went and worked in market research. And my obsession and sort of interest in anthropology came there when I worked on, I joined the qualitative research team at uh, Kelton Global, which is a market research firm in Los Angeles, and basically spent three years um, embedded with a cultural anthropologist on that team studying healthcare in the United States, doing ethnographic research basically traveling two to three weeks a month um, and, and spending a lot of time on the road and doing a lot of on the ground research um, and really just doing applied anthropology, taking a lot of the technology um, and digital learnings that I learned in my graduate work and bringing it to the real physical, traditional, more traditional applied anthropology space. And from there, I recognized that there was sort of a gap between the way traditional applied anthropology was happening in the market research world, um, the things that I learned in my graduate program, um, and the head of the qualitative research team at Carlton Global, a woman named Christine Chastain, um, who was really my mentor throughout my that part of my career. 
really championed me. And I started a lab inside of the organization focused on digital anthropology and starting to think about how do we start to translate um, and close that gap between how we study people physically and digitally, recognizing that people don't divide their lives like that. And we needed to make sure that we thought about new ways and tools to understand them in that way. Um, and so that was the beginning of my career. And that was really the entry into anthropology was landing in a qualitative um, research team about in 2009. So anyways, from there, um, one of the things about market research, it was very interesting, but a lot of market research and the lab that I was running was really just focused on gathering insights um, about different people and communities as a way to um, understand certain health issues um, that were going on um, and health conditions in the U.S. And what I really wanted to do was start to make action and change. I didn't want to just come up with ideas. I wanted to also come up with solutions. And so from that lab, I moved to New York City and went to work at What If Innovation, um, which is an innovation uh, consulting firm. And I started running a lab there, a digital anthropology lab. Um, and that was really focused on similar ideas. How do you use technology to understand people um, in digital spaces and physical spaces? Um, and then how do you understand human react um, behavior within technology? And I ran that lab for about nine years at What If Innovation, and it was basically embedded in every single innovation project that we ran because innovation um, isn't about just coming up with idea, new ideas in the world. It's about trying to find real human problems that haven't been solved yet. Now, if you need to do that, you need to really understand what is going on with a certain group of people or a culture or a community. And that requires thinking really deeply and trying to understand their blended life. And that's why our lab was really um, focused on that. And the last thing I'll say is that the reason that we started a lab um, around this is because a lot of the research technology at the time, um, and even today, was really not designed from an anthropological perspective. It wasn't designed to really get under the surface around why people do what they do. A lot of it was either just creating traditional forms of ethnography and making it digital, right? Um, so, you know, an online interview or an online ethnography, um, or it was really about uh, scale. So social analytics or looking at conversations online through numbers and not meaning. Um, and so I was, we were constantly kind of experimenting new ways to think about methods to get at depth um, and understand what people me meant and thinking about mixed methods and how do you blend different kinds of insights together to really understand what was going on under the surface. And so I spent a lot of time like rolling up my sleeves, not having the answers, being brave enough to continuously learn and adapt as technology constantly changed. Um, you know, the world around us was changing, um, but I'm really passionate about that gap in, in the sort of opportunity there to better understand people um, as we continue to evolve. Good. Thanks for that. So obviously there's a lot to unpack in there. Um, just to go back to your, pro your your education program for a second. So, you know, I remember that period well, and I'd be curious to know at that time, you know, what was an academic program thinking about this? Were, was it, were they, you know, excited? Were they kind of fearful? Like, you know, today there's a lot of now concern about what the impacts of all of this have been, you know, but I'm just curious at that point, what, what did academia think? That's a really great question because it is strange to think about it now because at the time it was all optimistic, very innovation, exciting, not necessarily bad. Um, yet, for example, I took an internet law class in my graduate work to try to understand what legal regulations were going on. And there was only one book on cyber law in 2009, which to me is sort of just relates to how much they had, the, the excitement was really big. And, you know, it was the time of MySpace was growing and, you know, teams from our graduate program were embedding in some of these different companies to try to understand how human sciences was being embedded, but not, not from a negative perspective. It was a curiosity perspective, right? Because it was very new. Um, of course, that's very different now. And there's a lot of privacy and ethical concerns um, around the space that I'm also very um, committed to thinking about ways to solve. But at that time in undergraduate, no, not as much. Yeah, it's kind of interesting because, you know, obviously we've learned a lot and that's going to contribute, that contributes to what I'm going to say next. But like, you know, with Web3 being the next major shift 
in the digital space. Today, everybody's kind of critical, or many people are critical. At that point, I mean, we certainly weren't critical, you know, in, in the firms that I was in, you know, everybody was excited by it for the opportunity. Uh, this time around, as we have like the next major moment in the internet in, in terms of decentralization, it, there's a very different perspective the way everybody's thinking about it, which is good. I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but it's it's impressive to see the difference in only roughly 12 years, say. I completely agree. It's fascinating. And I think it's a really good thing. You know, I think it's 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 sort of like being a child in the beginning and not knowing what to be afraid of yet, you know? And I think there was something around just this wide-eyed excitement of possibility and and now we're learning about that and you have to mess up to learn perhaps what was um, a mistake. So, so nonetheless, you, uh, you know, you go through this program, you come out, you find yourself in market research, doing ethnography, kind of getting your feet wet there. Uh, was that the first though, that you really got involved in qualitative skills? Like did the program talk qualitative at all or? Oh no. Yeah. We definitely did qualitative in the program. So our program was blended qualitative and quantitative research because it was uh, taught by sociology professors that were teaching qualitative and quantitative and different professors around the university. So we would do um, like immersions in World of Warcraft um, during my uh, graduate work, as well as doing quantitative surveys to um, test uh, theories and um original research, which was a lot of what our thesis projects were on. But um, we learned both. I would say, you know, at that time, it was very preliminary. A lot of the things that we were learning around um, also just like the concepts of um, what makes something a community in a digital space at that time and what community meant um, and the similarities and differences between those, those worlds and how to sort of how people thought about them and sort of how to recognize them. Because I think at that time, it wasn't so clear um, what made something um, important. Our program was inspired by the work of Henry Jenkins, um, who studied a lot of digital um, cultures at the time. And so that um, and fan cultures particularly. And that was sort of the inspiration for how we studied um, what was going on in these digital spaces, because things like fan culture and gaming culture were some of the early really um uh, lively um, cultures in some of these online spaces that were great for research. And so we did a lot of that, which helped you learn like, later on um, what that meant. So, And out of curiosity, did the did the program view these as distinct worlds and, al- and also did like the, you know, the people who were engaged in these worlds view them as distinct or did one find that they were really just sort of, that there really was no barrier? Or- That's such a great question. Um, I don't think that the program at the time was, I think the program at the time was talking about an online community as a separate thing than a physical community. Um, But there was also a lot of conversation around the amount of time that some people were spending in these online communities and almost overarching their life in that direction, which then created a lot of blurred lines between their physical um, and and, and in-person physical life, right? I don't want to say real because they're they're real in both ways. Um, But the differentiation, obviously, I think has changed um, in terms of like how a lot of people talk about it. So, Yeah, it's interesting just to hear that the history of it from like an academic perspective. You know, I I was in it from a business perspective, again, already kind of like selling those services like, you know, very early on. Um, And so we looked at it very different way, obviously. Uh, But and I've never I've never had a personal conversation, I guess, really with somebody who was going through an academic program at that point. So it's just interesting to hear how they were framing it out, and and obviously how we've kind of now come to appreciate it all is is you know and, and seeing the gap in between there. Yeah, and I mean full disclosure, I mean this was an experimental program. I was like the third class of this program, and they were figuring it out on their feet because it didn't exist, you know, and they didn't know how to teach it, and there weren't a lot of norms yet. So they were sort of learning and adapting curriculum every semester because things were changing so quickly at that time, which is fascinating. Also, I think a good learning around the career of learning that really comes with this field, right, on some level. So, And I would assume, you know, not only in terms of adapting and learning to what's just existing, but I would presume at least that, that they're how they're approaching it from a methodological perspective was also having to change, you know, just as they were learning more. Um, And so were they doing a lot of sort of innovation in that space or did that, did you see more of that once you got into, to your work career? 
That's a, so yeah, really interesting. I think that they were most comfortable applying quantitative research to those spaces and less qualitative, um, when I was there, although, um, uh, yeah, so I would say, you know, of course we did some immersions in digital spaces, um, and observations and, um, Tom Bostroff spoke, um, around second life during, um, one of the class years, um, I think I first pronounced his last name wrong, but I think he's great. Um, but anyway, so that, but that was not as normal. I think when we started, I started experimenting with digital methods, um, in my first job. Um, and that was basically working side by side with a cultural anthropologist who was really comfortable in the traditional ethnographic space. And then we just sort of co-created ways to start to iterate on those methods at that time. I mean, in in really small ways in the beginning, it was not. It was sort of looking at social listening um, as just conversations, right? Versus trying to analyze them as data and just trying to read the depth and starting to look at layers between how people presented themselves on different platforms and how to sort of look at all of that, um, those insights and look for patterns and start layering that on with different types of insights and um, approaches. So it, it became very organic, but most of the innovation from a qualitative perspective came from um, the company that I was working with, but the, not from them. It was just from the creative collision between Christine Chastain and myself um, that were really interested in that space. So you know, there are some people who think that when you take ethnography online that you, I don't know, you cheapen it, you know, you lessen it, you, it can't be like the real thing. You're not there in person to truly observe, et cetera, et cetera. What would you say to that based upon, you know, the years of work you've done in this space? Well, I guess it depends. I, I think from my perspective is all about um, diversity, right? So I think really good insight comes from looking at a problem or a community from multiple different perspectives. And I think in a digital space, I think it depends on what you're studying, right? If you're studying um, the metaverse or second life, there might be a lot more immersion in that space um, that were that doesn't require as much of the physical types of traditional methods. Um, but I think that usually good insight comes from looking at the problem from multiple perspectives and using multiple different methods to come at your um, insights. And so you can use a lot of different types of digital methods to do that and blend those together to gather insight. You can also use digital. So there's digital tools to study people in digital spaces. There's digital tools to study people in physical spaces, right? And so one of the great things that we were trying to do is trying to understand physical life and digital life. So having someone spend a week with, um, they everyone has a phone in their pocket, right? And so we'd be able to be there in the moment as they were um, buying groceries or every time they had to do a health check a certain time of day and trying to understand the emotional experience in that moment, having them share pictures and photos of their physical life while we also... Um, we're able to observe parts of their digital life. And so I think digital methods can be applied for both worlds. Um, and what's more important is that you're trying to look at it like an, not just the tip of the iceberg, but going underneath and using different methods to get underneath the difference between what people say and what they do, right? And that requires creativity um, and probably constant invention, right? As we're trying to think about how do you understand, because, you know, most people don't know why they do what they do. So if you ask them, that they're not going to be able to tell you. So, so can you speak? Uh, you know, I you gave a, a good overview there, but could you get into maybe some more specifics for people who have never done this work? Like, what might some of the methods look like that you would use over the years? It doesn't have to be right now; it could be historic as well, just over the past ten years, say. I mean, I think so. You know, some of the classic methods would be mobile ethnography, right? To study the physical world. So if I wanted to understand what a week in somebody's life or a month in someone's life, I might set up a mobile ethnography study where we might use a platform like DScout or Recollective um, and set up a diary study um, that's intuitive as possible for that person to complete. So you don't break that wall between natural behavior. Um, and ha maybe you have them at the end of the day, um, answer certain types of questions or anytime a certain, um, whatever your setting comes up in the middle of the day, you ask them to take pictures or a small video and share what's going on in that moment. So for me, when I was studying, trying to understand the physical world, I really wanted to understand 
how people felt when something happened to them, and then the difference between how they told that story back to themselves at the end of the day. Because there's a difference between what you experience in the moment and then the story that you tell yourself later. And so I was always trying to think about ways to think about the different stories that we tell ourselves as a way to look for deeper meaning and reflection. And so you, we would design traditional mobile ethnography studies around that to get at different stories, getting at videos, um, and having people share pictures of their lives. I mean, these were things that were, when I was doing traditional, like more, you know, in-person ethnographic research, it's very difficult to, um, have study somebody in all the moments of their life because you're not sitting next to them. It's uncomfortable, right, for them sometimes. You know, I did a really interesting study a while ago um, trying to understand, it was so, it was for um, trying to understand intimacy between couples, right, and what was preventing physical intimacy. Now, that would have been a very difficult study for me to do in person to watch and observe, especially as it's the in the moment versus the reflection. But I designed a diary study around it where I had people 15 minutes before they were intimate tell us about what they were anticipating or feeling, and then reflect afterwards. And it was an incredible way to get emotion and reflection in a way that would have been much more difficult for me to get similar insights had I been there in person. So that's one example. Of course, um, we would also do things like, of course, there's all kinds of various ways to do social listening and network analysis to study online conversation. Um, really interested in trying to understand empathy and storytelling in digital spaces. And so do would do a lot of studies around trying to code the different types of um, platforms in which we sit, share stories, right? And what mode you're in, uh, in terms of how you share a story differently on Twitter than, let's say, Reddit, than YouTube, than Instagram, et cetera, right? And so um, using that as a way to look at the different layers about how we tell our story and what types of stories are told in different ways. Um, you know, the a great example we would always do is, you know, the first time you you get that weird mole on your arm, you know, and you don't know what it is. You're not going to like wait and call the doctor. You're going to Google it immediately. Right. And so it's like, how can you use that as a way to learn about what is, what are people afraid of? Right. So Google trends would be a really interesting platform to say, well, what are the questions that people tend to ask around this? Right. And that's another strand of a data point. And I would start to blend things like Google trend data, looking at social listening data, doing my mobile ethnography work, um, doing traditional ethnography and recording videos while I'm doing it live as a way to look back um, on those conversations and blend all of those together to say, okay, well, what's really going on here? Sure. Now, earlier you mentioned with social listening that you're interested in finding the meaning and not some just sort of, you know, quant approach to it, which obviously makes a lot of sense given, you know, for this podcast and the audience. But, you know, there is, um, I bring that up because there is a lot of debate of social listening, right? And there's a lot of critique of it. And so, you mind just sharing a little there, you know, what's, what's been your experience? How do you think you do it differently than maybe a more quantitative approach? I mean, I think, you know, I think a quantitative approach is trying to look at something at a community of people at scale, right. Um, and get very quick changes in behavior and what people are doing and what they're saying, right. I'm sort of looking at why. It's the difference, right? And so a lot more of the approach that I, that the more qualitative approach is reading and looking at stories and trying to layer like real conversations. It's not necessarily about size. It's about thick data, right? So I'm not looking at as many people, but I'm going very deep um, and reading the stories and the interactions and the conversations, um, looking at, you know, different kinds of forums. Let's say, you know, I've done some research on forums around trying to get pregnant, right? And there's a lot of emotion in terms of the advice that people give each other and the stories and the acronyms that they have to share with each other in terms of how they code things. Now, that would be very diff difficult to understand um, if you're just looking at it through a quantitative perspective, but I would go in and read it, right? And try to be there with them as much as I could to try to understand what isn't being said, right? What's missing here. And it's trying to fill those gaps. Of course, I, and I'm not, I'm not demonizing quantitative or big data in any way. I think it's just well, both of them are valuable, right? And I think a lot of the social listening platforms struggled to give you enough tools to get at that depth because I think their business model was more focused on the more analytical side of it. 
So what about the potential critique? Like, say, you just mentioned forums. So what about the potential critique of, you know, you're in there sort of lurking, nobody knows what you're doing. How have you, you know, how have you dealt with that in your career? How do you rationalize that? You know, where do you stand on it? Yeah, it's it's a, I think it's a constantly changing, um, top, like in terms of positioning. I think historically, I think the concept for a lot of people was just like, if it's public, right, it's out there, it's not behind a private wall, right? You're just looking at public data or public comments, then it's okay in the same way that um, somebody that might have been looking at that if they had that condition to try to understand information about that would be. So I think, you know, I'm interested to see where that conversation goes, right? Um, I think traditionally my perspective was like, well, if it's public data, then it's already in the public um, domain, let's say. Um, and then it's okay to use that to understand what's going on. I wouldn't be taking usernames or any like personal information because a lot of it is anonymous um, or using that, um, but it was a way to learn, right? Um, so not associating an individual with a comment, let's say, but using it as a way to learn about the community. So I think my line was, this is the public forum, this is the public domain, um, this information's out there. Of course, if it's behind, if it's hidden, then that's a completely... Um, unacceptable space to go into without calling yourself out. And I've definitely, you know, now there's conversation about making an announcement that you're doing research as you go into these places to read. And I think there's a lot of debate on that and I'm still learning. Um, I'd be curious to hear what, how you think about it as well, because I think it's a really complex space. Actually, it was one of the comments that was brought up at um, the, why the world needs anthropologists um, forum in Prague um, around. And I think the conversation was pretty similar, but yeah, well, so because you brought that up, maybe we can sort of slowly transition here to to the Live Center and what you're doing. And so let's, let's sort of fast forward. And I guess first, tell me, like, you know, what what do you see as the as the opportunity and the threats here in the digital anthropology space? Um, well, so the first thing is, as I said, the Live Center is about digital innovation in anthropology, not just digital anthropology, because I think. Um, digital affects all of anthropologists, right? Because everybody lives in a digital and physical world. Um, and right now I think digital anthropology is a particular field within anthropology. So I just wanted to make that differentiation. But, um, you know, we, for us, I think so much of the focus around why the Live Center was, um, uh, the nonprofit was created was really sort of recognizing that you know, the world has invested and built and spent probably trillions of dollars building the digital world and probably a pretty small amount trying to understand the impact of it on people. Um, and, you know, the idea that quantitative and big data has really sort of taken the lead um, in a lot of businesses and decisions and public policy um, drivers um, to help people make decisions in a constantly fast changing world, right? If there's, it's quick. It has a huge amount of size that creates a lot of certainty um, in a particularly changing and unknown space. Um, but we see that the there's a lack of qualitative context behind that that creates a lot of um, issues around ethics, issues around privacy, um, issues around the perpetuation of inequality when things aren't seen, right? So there's an invisibility to... Um, how people and cultures are in these digital spaces that we're just not investing in trying to understand and also promoting and, and driving um, and scaling the ability for more people to study this, right? I think um, anthropology is a particularly um, excellent field at trying to understand what a community is, who they are, what is what is meaningful, why they exist, what, what meaning... Um, is important to a group of people um, so that you can go from a world where you know that there is a lot of fake news going on uh, to a world where you know why people believe in the stories that they believe. And you can have a better conversation with them, not because they believe in fake news, but because you know why they think that and what that means to them. And then you can have a more effective way to have a conversation, right? Versus just an altercation. Um, and I think 
What we're trying to do at the Live Center is look lots of people all over the world, incredible anthropologists and data scientists and researchers are already thinking about this. That we're not the first in any way. Our goal is to really recognize that we need deeper insights into humanity at scale all over the world from the global north to the global south. Um, and we need to advance the investment in digital tools and methods um, to under to bring anthropology and digital innovation and anthropology everywhere around the world in the same way that it's invested in data science, right? But also making sure that when we teach um, students in this generation and the next generation, we're not just teaching anthropology or data science. We're thinking about a blended way to understand people and sort of thinking about that mixed methodology in terms of training um, and interdisciplinary education because um, we believe in a future where data science and data scientists and anthropologists are always working together across all sectors of society. It's like a counterbalance, right? They're two sides of the same coin and they become partners in understanding so that we can in the future try to preempt potential issues around ethics and privacy and bias by having people that think differently ask questions about what we're doing. Um, what kind of insights can we learn here? And how can we design policies that are effective for the people that they're serving so we can see certain types of people that might be invisible to a data set, let's say. Um, and so what we're trying to do with the Live Center is scale some of the work that lots of people are already doing, drive more attention and awareness to how important this is across all sectors of society, from the public sector to academia to the private sector, and then create career paths. Uh, for people so that we can have anthropologists working and, and, and not just anthropologists. I think there's a, um, anthropologists and, and anthropology enthusiasts, people that want to think like anthropologists. I think we need to make it more accessible, uh, for more people, um, to, to be that, um, and, and, and invest in, um, research to show that this kind of thinking makes a difference, um, in how we understand people in the world. So, you know, I would agree with everything you just said and, of course, support the cause. But to ask, you know, the the challenging question, you know, why why do you think that you can convince people of qualitative now when, you know, this conversation of qual versus quant has been going on for so long? And I don't, I'm not doubting you. I'm just saying, like, you know, I mean, we need to do it now. It's it's already too late. So I'm not, not... The timing is not really the point of my question. It's more about like, you know, what do you think you're all going to do differently? You know, or what do you have planned that you think is going to help overcome that that very historic debate? Because in a sense, like, you know, data science is like the new econ in many ways, where like, you know, that's sort of the go-to that you're seeing now in 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 mass media, right? In popular culture. Um and so you know, we we had a hard time kind of getting our seat at the table in the past, say, in comparison to an economist or a psychologist. So, you know, again, what are you going to do different? Well, I mean, I think part of this is, you know, we're working with UNESCO right now. Um, so UNESCO recognized um, the, the need um, to bring more digital innovation to anthropology. And we're doing a four-year project uh, partnership with UNESCO uh, to work with uh, public policymakers, um, ambassadors uh, around the world to think about, um, to raise awareness of the need for this in all sectors of society and to think about it globally, right? Not just in the global north, um, but to think about how and to demonstrate how when you incorporate this kind of thinking, thick data and big data, anthropology and data science together, you get deeper insight to drive impact. So a lot of what we want to do is do research projects around the world to demonstrate that in different countries, to create degree programs um, in those countries, um, to train a new generation of people that think like this and raise awareness within local governments and um, countries around the value of this skill set. I think the world has gotten to a point where we've seen what happens when big data goes unchecked and when data science designs the world on some level, right? And I think it's a world that we don't, you know, without that checks and balances perspective, I think we would start to move towards a world that we don't want to live in. And a world that might not be designed for people in the way that we want, that, that humanity would value. Um, and I think that 
to me is almost the example that we're using as a way because we've seen issues um, where mental health um, in social media and on social platforms um, is becoming an issue. We, we see bias in big data and algorithms um, making groups of people seem invisible. Um, these are issues that I think are not on the sidelines, but are front and center because of the the energy at which big data has advanced and data science has advanced. And I also don't want mean to demonize data science. I think it's really important no, to sure. say that both of them are important and I think they need each other. And actually, oftentimes data scientists are are just as passionate about this um, in terms of finding other people to collaborate um, with um, and think about ways to uh, advance and and drive more ethical uh, standards um, within their work. So I think it's it's timing, honestly, in terms of what we've seen recently um, in the tech world. And I think because we're working with um, UNESCO on this four-year partnership that allows us to create um, you know, UNESCO is a platform, right, for conversation and common ground and bringing people together and using that as a way to drive awareness um, within the public sector and across different governments and countries um, is a way to look at finding a way to bring lots of different people together around this issue and then to have conversations um, with people at scale um, within different countries. Because I think one of the issues around this, and I'm always still learning, so I'm sure there's a, probably a million things about this that I don't know, there definitely is. Um, but um, I think one of the issues is lots of people are, are have been, I mean, this is a common topic, of course, and lots of people have been working on digital tools that bring thick and big data together in different ways. Um, I mean, Trisha Wang got up on the TED stage in 2013 and rose consciousness around the value of thick data in incredible ways. Um, and I think the work, the, the project that we're doing with UNESCO helps to create a common ground of bringing everyone together around um, in one space, because I think it's, um, there's just so many different networks and groups of people that it's hard to almost harness that. And so that would be um, one way. I, so I have a question about education and I guess you could answer this from your perspective or if the live center has already like a, you know, a perspective on this, you know, whatever, what it, from whichever angle you want to take it is fine. Um, but what do you envision for the future of, you know, bringing digital into anthropology? Is it too early to say, do you have ideas that, you know, right now that you'd like to see programs get started on? It's a big question. I mean, I think the reason that we're starting this is to figure out the answer to that question, to be totally honest, is is how do we find ways to bring those two skill sets together to unearth um, new insights and new ways to apply those to each other? How can they influence each other, right? Um, I think, you know, there's, I'm like sitting at my desk with these books by wonderful people like um, Darius Jamilniak, which who wrote Thick Big Data. And, and lots of people have come up with ways to start blending thick and big data and think about these two types of data um, together. Um, SODAS in Copenhagen is doing some incredible work as well as the Tech Anthropology Lab. Um, so there's a lot of academic labs and programs that are already thinking about interesting ways to blend data science and anthropology or computational anthropology. And there's so many different ways to do this. I think what we want to do is make it more mainstream and start experimenting with more ways to do this that can be directly pulled into careers and jobs and applied back because the only way that we're going to see impact from an educational perspective is if the work that the way the work that you learn in academia and around bringing data science and anthropology together in terms of methods and and approaches and tools, right, that are designed with both in mind, because oftentimes tools are designed for one or the other, right? Um, it must be applied back into a job and a career and impact in that way, whether that you're in the public sector or the private sector. For us, and what we want to do is that's really the goal is to make sure that we can make change in the world, right, through what's learned in the, in the university environment. Um, you know, so much of the work that we're doing with UNESCO is really around the sustainable development goals, right, and using digital innovation and anthropology as a way to support achieving those, uh, providing more insights into things like gender inequality, right? Um, but that only works when you can actually see impact in the real world outside of academia. 
Not that academia isn't the real world, but you know what I mean. You've put on, the Live Center, I should say, has put on a few talks, a few events so far. You know, again, you mentioned, you briefly mentioned why the world needs anthropologists last year in September. I think, you know, you had one major event there and then you were also on a panel. Had uh, at least another event since that I saw. So obviously, you know, you're kind of active, I think getting maybe more active. Anything coming up, you know, that people should be aware of? Yeah. So, well, so this has been our year of, you know, stress testing the problem in the world that we're trying to solve. So we spent, we were basically in our first year of this partnership, um, spending some time setting it up and doing some launch events with, um, on the floor of UNESCO, um, with the public sector. And we've done a couple events uh, as well, um, within academic settings. Um, we are, um, launching upco- upcoming, we will be doing an open design challenge, a 48 hour challenge over the weekend. Um, uh, around coming up with new ways to bring thick and data together to solve um, a real world problem, um, which we will be releasing very soon in, in a matter of probably in a week. Um, so I encourage everybody uh, to sign up to live.org to um, come and join us for that challenge. Um, one of the things that we want to do is just bring thinkers and students and graduate students and people that are curious around the intersection, that liminal space between um, anthropology and data science, and are interested in new ways to think about methods and technologies um, of how we understand people in these digital spaces and how how they exist and where, where meaning comes from. Um, again, there's also a lot of people that have already written and thought about this, but what we want to do is provide opportunities to get people excited and thinking about this as well. And we'll be offering grants um, to winners uh, to advance those ideas further. We'll also have a call for papers coming up um, around these issues as well. Um, so I encourage everybody to come and sign up at live.org, L I I V.org, double I. Um, we're also on Twitter at the Live Center. Um, and we'll be continuing to work towards um, our goals. I think, you know, we see this as just the beginning um, of impact and are really interested in collaborating with as many people as possible that have passion around this space because we think this is an important issue for society. And if anybody wanted to get in touch with you personally? Oh, yeah. you could, It's just my name. It's K Hillier, H-I-L-L-I-E-R at live.org. Thank you for listening to the Anthropology and Business Podcast. To learn everything you need to break into business anthropology and why business anthropology is one of the best lenses for contributing to business success, visit my website at madarts.me, where I cover many topics related to business anthropology and beyond. There you will find all the podcast episodes, blogs, and news. Please like, share, and subscribe. See you next time.